Mark chapter 4 tells the story of Jesus and his disciples crossing Lake Gennesaret when a violent storm suddenly comes up. The disciples, fearing for their lives, cry out to Jesus, who's asleep on a pillow and oblivious to the peril. We know how Jesus calmed the storm by his command, and today you'll hear the rest of that story. And how it applies to us. Stay tuned. This is Lifeline Today. Welcome to Lifeline Today. We are glad you're part of the program. Our phones are open. We always love hearing from you. And of course, if you have prayer requests or want to connect with us, that's always possible. We also are online continually as well on our Facebook page and on our website. Good to have you with us. And we are having a great time today as we talk about just a very unique incident uh, that took place in the life of the disciples. But let me begin with a very special song. Many of you will recognize it. It's called, When Peace Like a River. I'm gonna tell you a little story about it, but perhaps you remember these verses. It says, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. I want to tell you about the person who wrote this song and said those words. It's an amazing story. It is well with my soul was written by a successful lawyer, Christian lawyer, Horatio Spafford, who was a great supporter of D.L. Moody. His only son died at age four in 1871. In 1872, the Great Chicago Fire wiped out his vast real estate fortune made from a successful legal career. In 1873, he sent his wife and four daughters over to Europe on a summer trip on the ill-fated ship SS Ville du Havre. Since he had a lot of work to do, he planned to follow them later. The ship sank and he lost his four daughters with his wife being the only survivor. She sent him the now famous telegram which simply read, Saved Alone. On his return home, his law firm was burned down and the insurance company refused to pay him, saying it's an act of God. He had no money to pay his bills, no work, so he lost his home. Then while sitting and thinking what's happening to him and being a very strong Christian, he wrote this song, Whatever my Lord you have taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. He went on to rebuild his life. And he and his wife, who had another son and three daughters, they moved to Israel where they lived out their lives, leading a mission to both Jews and Arabs and having a very successful ministry during that time. He also made this very well-known quote as he wrote that song. I am glad to be able to trust my Lord when it costs me something. Those are amazing words. Amazing words. If a man was in the middle of a storm, much like the disciples with Jesus in the boat in Mark chapter 4, this man certainly was. And his proclamation was, it is well, it is well. And to even say, I am proud or I am glad to be able to say I can trust my Lord when it costs me something. Can you imagine losing everything after having great gain and great success and being left penniless? Thankfully, God helped him to rebuild his life. This takes us to the story about when Jesus calmed the sea. I'm going to be reading from Mark chapter 4, but it's actually found in three different Gospels. And there are uh, pretty much the same story, but a few details that vary uh, or give us a little more understanding. Mark 4, starting in verse 35, says this, On the same day, when the evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and the other boats were with him also. And great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the quiet wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? 
And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is one of the very unusual accounts of the miracles of Jesus. It stands out because of its uniqueness. And even the disciples commented, Who is this person that the wind and the waves actually obey his command? But they had just finished ministering the Sermon on the Mount and all of the ministry. Huge crowds had followed Jesus. And that's the time they got into the boat to go to the other side, which actually was the area of the Gadarenes. But then it says a windstorm arose. Now, two of the other Gospels say it arose suddenly. So it was something unusual. It wasn't your typical windstorm. And it then notes also that he was in the stern or the back of the boat sleeping. And it also notes this, that he was comfortable. He was laying on a pillow. This really does tell us a story here. In this violent situation, Jesus is asleep on a pillow. It says that they wake him. And they presume that Jesus is being different for some reason, indifferent to their situation. And they're fearful. And they said to him, don't you care that we are perishing? That was the wrong thing to say. Jesus, it says, stood up and said, now you know these words, peace be still. But do you know what the margin says in your Bible? Go check your own Bible. You'll see it says in bold letters, be quiet. He actually stood up and rebuked this storm in a very authoritative way. Be quiet like that, you know, kind of like a parent when they need to have their attention, the children's attention. And then he asked them these two questions. Why are you so fearful? Have you still no faith? Now, why would he say still no faith? And the reason would be is because he had already demonstrated to them his authority over all of the kinds of demonic realm, but also the natural realm. And they had seen him perform miracles. But now they've got into the boat. And he said, let's get into the boat. Let's go to the other side. But they, and, and in the journey, when the wind came up, they began to doubt. Why are we here? And obviously, Jesus is so tired. He's asleep. He doesn't care. He, we're perishing and he's indifferent. You know, this sounds like a lot of us when we go into the storms of life. We are walking with the Lord. We're happy. We're joyful. We know his presence in our lives, but then a storm comes and the first thing that we have is why am I here and why Jesus are you not even concerned about my welfare? Don't you care? But even to say we are perishing, which is why his response is why are you so fearful? Why is he saying that? Well, first of all, I believe that in the storms of life, God wants us to have faith. He wants us to understand that our life is in his hand, not in circumstances, that we will leave this planet at the appointed time. You know, it says that in the book of Hebrews, it is appointed once unto man to die. We have an appointed day. But secondly, he says, have you still no faith? If we have walked with the Lord through circumstances, we ought to understand something. We ought to understand that he is faithful. He will never leave us. He'll never forsake us. It says so in Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews in chapter 13. He will never forsake us. So we can trust him in the things that are going on, even when we don't understand them. But there's more to this story that I really want to actually tell you about. I think it has application to where we are right now in Canada and in the world. We're in a boat and the wind and the waves are blowing and beating against the boat. And I hear a lot of people who are panicking. They're looking at the circumstances. They're shouting about various issues like masking and loss of freedom and other things, which obviously are a concern for everybody. But their eyes are upon that. And yet in this situation, Jesus in the boat with his disciples, having said we're crossing to the other side, seems completely unconcerned. All those things are happening. He doesn't deny that, but he's unconcerned about what they are. But here, let me tell you what I think it is. Immediately after this miracle, Jesus and his disciples reach the other shore. It's the area of Gadara. And you know this story, that there was a demoniac who lived and he was probably from a biblical perspective, the most demonized person that we've ever heard of. 
He even said, my name is Legion because we are many, meaning many demonic spirits had held this man captive. It said they chained this man, chains and bound him and the strength within this individual because of the demonic oppression and possession, he would break the chains and run. And then it would say he would be in the hills and in the, in the graveyards, cutting himself with stones and crying out, probably terrorizing the whole region. And so they all knew about this man. And so Jesus is on that mission. He goes to the other side. He's met by this individual. And you know the story. Jesus actually commanded those demons to leave. They asked for permission to go into a herd of swine. And those swine ran down a hill into the sea or in the lake of Gennesaret and drowned. Someone said that even pigs have enough common sense not to live a life under demonic oppression. But it, of course, uh, it had another ramification. It affected the livelihood of the people in the region, which is why they came to him and begged him to leave their country. But there's also more to that story. The demoniac, now delivered and clothed and sitting at the feet of Jesus, asks and begs Jesus, I want to go with you. I want to be your disciple. And you know, the probability is he would have been the best disciple of all the 12. He would have been exemplary in every way because he had been set free. You know, uh, Mary Magdalene was the same. She had been delivered from a prostitution, a life of prostitution and demonic oppression and uh, was set free, completely delivered. She was the most faithful and loyal. She was the first to see Jesus in his resurrection. She was an amazing person who followed him and was devoted to him throughout her life. I'm sure this demoniac would have been the same. But you know what Jesus said to him? Jesus said to him, no, you can't come with me. You stay in this country and you tell the people of the good things that God has done for you. So he, do you want to know a little history? And this hasn't really been evident until probably in the, the last 50 years or so. Archaeology has discovered remains of many churches in that whole region. It's known as the Decapolis, 10 cities. In that whole region now, they're uncovering Byzantine churches, which means that, that these are in the first four or five centuries of Christianity. Churches, and some of them very large, and, and on your screen you see a picture of one of the remains, one of the larger ones, beautiful churches. And why do we say that? It is very likely that this same individual that was delivered spread the gospel, particularly after the resurrection of Jesus, and evangelized this area so effectively that churches sprung up in the entire region. What's, what's the story here? Well, I believe what we are experiencing in our nation and many nations in the world, I would call it white noise. White noise, it's all grabbing our attention. And I, I'm afraid to say that many believers are getting so caught up in this whole narrative that they're missing something. You know what I believe they're missing? Just like Jesus, he knew he was on a mission to another region and he knew there would be a great deliverance. I believe we as the body of Christ are on the verge of a great deliverance. I don't mean easy times and I'm not even talking political issues because quite obviously, honestly, the gospel has advanced in hostile political environments more aggressively than it's when in peacetime. I'm just saying that as an observation of history. But nevertheless, a great deliverance. And here's what I believe. We are about to see God do some of the greatest things on planet Earth. Now, why, why can I say that? Do you know that at the beginning of the 1900s, the population was only over a billion people, almost one and a half billion. Today, we're approaching eight billion. Now, think about this. The transformation of the planet in the last hundred years is astronomical. Why are we ready for the great harvest? Because there's so many souls. And by the way, eight is the number of new. I wouldn't be surprised if eight billion is the timing for a great harvest on this earth. I believe we're heading for a great deliverance, just like Jesus noted in this situation. And incidentally, it says that when he rebuked the storm, a great calm came. Well, actually, two gospels say that. You know what that tells me? That the nature of the storm was spiritual. 
that there was a demonic element to it. Because you can't just rebuke any storm. But this storm had a demonic element. And very obviously, it had some connection to this demoniac that ruled this region, the principality that ruled that region. Yet Jesus knew it was time for deliverance. Here's a few thoughts that I want to leave with you. When Jesus gave his mission to the disciples, they should have been secure and had faith in the fact that he said, let us go to the other side. Secondly, the storm was a distraction. But the region that was about to be saved was the goal and the purpose. And let's remember that for today. And thirdly, we should never give place to rejection and fear. Remember what they said? Lord, don't you care that we are perishing? Listen, if Jesus in the, is in the boat, even if it looks like he's sleeping, we're okay. You're okay. We'll be okay. I believe that Jesus is in the boat and we can have the peace of God and recognize what he's about to do. Help change the spiritual climate of Canada by becoming a monthly partner with Lifeline Today with Dick and Joan. All donors will receive this Lifeline Today fridge magnet, a reminder that you stand with Dick and Joan for Canada. Pledge your support for $25 a month and receive the booklet, Your Lifeline Today, Scriptures for Your Every Need. In it, you'll find prayer strategies, scriptures, and testimonies to build your faith for healing, family salvation, finances, and more. Partner at $50 a month and receive as a thank you this elegant display showcasing a replica of the widow's might as spoken of by Jesus in Mark 12. This powerful reminder of sacrificial giving will inspire you daily. Lifeline Today would also like to send you this finely crafted communion set when you partner at $100 a month. This silver plated serving tray with goblets is decorated with a panorama etching of the holy city of Jerusalem and is a beautiful display for any home. Your tax-deductible donation will empower this ministry to release the prophetic word of God across our nation. Call today and say yes to becoming a partner with Dick and Joan. In Philippians 2, 9 to 10, it says, Therefore God elevated him, Jesus, to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. There is power, there is authority in the name of Jesus. Say his name with me right now. Say, Jesus, Jesus, sickness must bow, COVID must bow, cancer must bow, addictions must bow to the name of Jesus, poverty, debt, whatever the enemy has sent against you, they must bow to the name of Jesus. Jesus is your savior, your healer, your deliverer, your provider. He is all that you need. Give us a call right now here at the prayer center. Tell us your need and we'll pray together in the mighty name of of Jesus. It's absolutely right, Jill. Jesus. Yes. You know, and he's the one that calmed the sport. You know, they, the disciples were absolutely amazed yes, in the were. story that I just told. Uh, it recorded in three gospels that he would rebuke the wind and the waves. And it went, it says in it, there was a great calm, yeah. very contrast, big contrast. But that's Jesus. He yeah. has that authority. You know, I'm, Joan, I'm just so glad that my life is in his hands, and I know your life is in his hands. That's right. And you know, Dick, when those um, disciples were in the boat and Jesus was sleeping in the boat, I wonder what they thought. You know, it says they cried out to him, don't you care that we perish? Yeah. But he was asleep in the boat. And what he wanted his disciples to learn was that when he was asleep, they could be at peace. At peace. Yeah. You know, and, well, and uh, you know, there are so many people right now, Dick, that are in a boat. And I was thinking, even as you were preaching this, I was thinking about some, uh, and I know that you're watching, there are some of you watching who have recently had prophetic words given to them about what God was going to do in your life. And immediately, the exact opposite has happened you know and and so now you're confused and you're wondering about god did you really say that is this really your will for me uh is this really going to happen it's a distraction but god says jesus is in the boat and so what you need to do is keep your peace because if god says something he's taking you to the other side and it's going to happen yeah 
I do wonder sometimes when I've read that story, mm -hmm. uh, what if the disciples hadn't woke, awoken Jesus? What would have been the case? Now, I'm going to just speculate. It says that Jesus was in the back of the boat, sleeping on a pillow. Yeah. Because <laughs> now, listen, he wasn't just sleeping. He made sure he was comfortable. Yeah. And that he was had no intention of waking up. My thing, my belief is this, is that the storm would have never uh, succeeded. It wouldn't have materialized. It wouldn't it, have materialized. It came up. Yeah. And this is the way the enemy works. He tries to intimidate you with his biggest show. With fear. And with fear. Mm -hmm. But if you don't, Eat the fear. If you don't buy into the fear, <laughs> he, he becomes powerless. Uh -huh. And I think the storm would have abated. Mm. Uh, but, of course, the disciples insisted that Jesus uh, intervene on this situation because they awoke him. And, yeah. and with these questions, Lord, we are dying, we're perishing, <laughs> and don't you care? Yeah. What right. a great way to wake up, huh? <laughs> and so you can see why Jesus responded and says, what's the matter with you? You know, I just, we're going to the other side. And where's your faith? You I know. know. Uh, yeah. And you know, here we, it is, too. Again, Jesus said, let's go to the other side. Yeah. So he knew that he, had, he, he had declared already where they were going and what they were going to do. Amen. But, and Dick, you said it in your teaching, and I think this is so uh, pertinent, is you said that Jesus knew what was going to happen yeah. uh, with the demoniac of Gadara on the other side yeah. of the lake. He knew that there was going to be a great deliverance. And I was reading that whole passage again, and it's so, it's so incredible, all the details that is in that passage. You know, it says when Jesus came to the shore, that man ran to, to Jesus and bowed before him and said, what have I got to do with you? Yeah. Why are you here? Yeah. And so it was a demon speaking through him. Yeah. Then later they found out that the demon's name, name was Legion, which meant many. And so you have to, you have to wonder if the demon in that person represented a stronghold over oh, the entire so. area. That's where the storm came and from. And Jesus knew he was going to go and deal with the stronghold over this entire area because it was going to be broken. His power would be broken and revival was coming. There's something you said, though, that if people need to hear. Guess who was more fearful? Was it the <laughs> disciples afraid of the storm or was it the demon the demons, the demon was fearful, very fearful of Christ. And the storm was actually a reaction of fear. Yes. By the spiritual realm. Yes, right. Because they knew who was coming in authority. Yeah. And so that's something you need to keep in mind. You're in a storm. You need to remember, wait a minute, the storm is intimidated by me. Yeah. Because I have the greater one on the inside. Is that presumptuous? No. And that's he's faith. in the boat. Greater is he that's in me. <laughs> than he yeah. that is in the world, but Scripture I just, says. I, I'm so convinced in my heart that the application of this um, Scripture, Dick, is for us, not just in Canada, but the world. We are so on the cusp of a great harvest, and the enemy is pulling out every stop to try and distract and cause fear and whatever he can do. And I thought it was interesting when this demon named Legion, because they were many, he said, there are many of us, and then it said, that the demons begged Jesus not to send them out of their country yeah. because that was their jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. That was, you know, the, the area that they had uh, rule over. And um, I, I really believe that we're going to be seeing some mass deliverances that are going to change the spiritual temperature over cities, over provinces, over nations, and revival is going to be the result. But I want to say to our viewers, because uh, I give this direct application, I have been concerned with what I see a trend in terms of many in the body of Christ who are alarmists at mm -hmm. various issues, masking and vaccines and mm -hmm. lockdowns and liberties and so on. And I'm not diminishing that. I'm no. not saying it doesn't exist. Neither would Jesus say the storm didn't exist. He mm -hmm. rebuked the storm. But there was something bigger going on. And I think, I, I think I believe, I've felt this way from the beginning of the lockdowns mm -hmm. and the whole COVID fear thing. I, I believe that actually on the other side of that would be a great move of God. And all of this was to <laughs> hold back what God was intending to do. Yes, I you believe see, that. even locking down churches and locking down everyone 
and, and they're actually creating havoc in the economy is a, 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 a feeble stop gap measure yeah. by the spiritual realm to stop the harvest. You know, many prophets of this uh, century have prophesied a billion soul harvest. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, it doesn't just recent, it goes back a hundred years yeah. that uh, these prophets saw a great uh, season of harvest beyond anything else. And you've got to put this into perspective. When some of these prophesied it, their population was on one and a half billion. Mm -hmm. Today we are pushing 8 billion. Well, we're 7.7 .7 or something like mm -hmm. that. And we're approaching 8 billion. I think those numbers are significant. I do too. And that means that the harvest is ripe. And by the way, don't you know that says that in the book of <laughs> Revelation, that there's a moment of time when the Lord says, it's ripe. The harvest right. is ripe. And that's the time when the end will come. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how close that is, but I do know this. Before we leave planet Earth, there will be a plundering of hell and a populating of heaven. <laughs> and so let's put our faith in the right place. Amen. I don't. I ask you, don't give place to fear. See, that's what the disciples said. Don't you care? Don't you care? We're perishing. Mm -hmm. What's the matter with you? Mm -hmm. That's what they were saying to the Lord. I don't yeah. want to be in that camp questioning and, and crying about what's going on around us without looking at the bigger picture. We're on a journey and Jesus is going to finish the job. It says that the, this is how the Lord said it. As surely as I live, he mm. said, all the earth will be filled with the knowledge of his glory as the waters cover the sea. My goodness, that's, he says, as surely as I live, it's going to happen before the end of the age. Yeah. All the earth will be filled. I that's believe right. we're on the cusp of it. Yes, we are. You and I heard a word. Prepare, prepare, prepare. That's mm -hmm. the reason we're upgrading our television. And actually, it's not the only thing, right, Joe? No. We've been doing a lot of other stuff. We're mm. creating a, an app for all of our viewers and, and uh, for the ministry so that we can connect because we are believing that yeah. there is a great harvest very Amen. near. And we want you to be a part of it. And by the way, as you're sowing into our equipment and into this ministry, you're sowing into the harvest. Amen. Just, we're one of many, but we're you're sowing into mm -hmm. media is a great way. We yeah. can reach so many people. Yeah. yeah. And by the way, the app is so that we can reach more people. Yeah. People under 50 don't watch TV as much. They watch <laughs> their phones. And so we yeah. want to do that as well. And it's, we're investing in that, Joan, so it'll be that way. Let's pray for you. We pray right now that the peace Thank of you, God Lord. will rule and reign in your heart mm -hmm. in the storm that you're in. Yes, we thank you, Lord, for your grace on every one of us in this thank season you, and in this time. Amen. Thank you for being a part of the program. We love and appreciate you. And remember this, Canada will be saved. Amen. This program is supported by viewers like you, and we thank you for partnering with us. We want to hear from you. Send us your prayer requests, praise reports, and comments about the program. To watch past episodes, learn about the ministry, or contact us, visit our website at dickandjoan.com. You can also find us on Facebook at Lifeline Today with Dick and Joan and on our YouTube channel, Dick and Joan TV.